Hello, it's the Rotary Talk. My name is Tom Anderson. Back, back, Tom, 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 Tom Anderson. Back, 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 back,
like that. Okay. Uh, it was a thrill, and they were. I covered some of the worst Islander teams in the, ever, you know, <laughs> history of sport. But it's you know, it still was just a thrill to be around that, knowing the history of the building and getting to know even some of the players that I used to root for. The first time I ever met Bob Nystrom, the first time I ever met, uh, you know, Bill Smith and Bob yeah. Mike Boss, Coach Butch Coyne. Like, it was a thrill for me, and, um, you know, it, it was great. It was, uh, you know, I look back, I, I miss those days. I love covering that team, and I keep telling MSG, if they ever need someone to do a broadcast, you know, they know who to call. <laughs> nice, nice. Growing up, which writers did you look up to? What kind of who style did you like? I uh, yeah, it's a great question. Um, again, reading Newsday with a lot of uh, a lot of the guys who covered the teams that I I enjoyed the most. So um, Mike Lupo at the time wrote for Newsday when I was younger, hmm. and I enjoyed his columns. And uh, I would read the Daily News and um, as well, of course. Mm-hmm. But I you know there was. Um, Tim Moriarty covered the Islanders way back when. Mm-hmm. Aline Elliott, who writes for the LA Times now, uh, she she covered the Islanders back then. And they were people that I, you know, Pat Calabria, mm-hmm. uh, were a lot of those kind. And, and then of course, um, you know, with the, and you put me on the spot. Uh, for some reason, I'm drawing a blank with the Knicks coverage, which is really bad because they, you know, Tim Layton, of course, was a really good mm. uh, basketball writer and. Uh, and God, I'm, I'm drawing a blank, which is embarrassing. But <laughs> there are several, several others, some of whom I've gotten to meet after the fact that I've told them, man, I loved, I loved reading your coverage, and, uh, you know, you did it right. And they would always say, wow, you make me feel really old right now. <laughs> 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 That's but, good. you know, really, um, you know, that, a lot of those guys, Dean Jacobson was a great columnist there who was a real entertaining read, very good. Um, you know, I can go, I really could literally go on and on with some of the guys that, that I read. But uh, Mark Kriegel from the Daily News remains one of my favorite writers, and now now he's an author, of course. But mm-hmm. he's the guy that I tried in the very beginning to emulate the most when it comes to the thing they call voice. What are your thoughts on the whole newspaper industry right now and the direction it's going? It's, uh, well, I mean, it's, it's inevitable. I remember an argument. Uh, Joe Shad, who now is a college football uh, writer for ESPN.com, right? We see a lot on TV there. He became a big star. Uh, <laughs> he was a uh, an intern at Newsday way back um, when I was still there as a part timer. He and I used to talk about the business. And he and I once had this debate where he felt like there'll be a time where there's no longer a newspaper where it's just electronic. Hmm. And and he, you know, he, he, I mean, he had the he had the right foresight there because, I mean, you can get newspapers on tablets now, Yep. Uh, obviously on your computer screen, but now, I mean, literally on a, on a tablet, which we didn't know about back then, this was in the late 90s, Right. Um, I said that I felt like there, people like tangible things, and that I felt a newspaper, newsprint, a paper you can leave through will still always have an impact in the world, um, and I still believe that, but it's inevitable that it would change over to be more... Uh, involved with the, with the web and blogs and video that we see now incorporated in a lot of this stuff. But I still think columnists and a voice and the entertainment part of it, uh, uh, back pages, I still think that's important. Hmm. What I don't like is that it's, it's kind of going cheap in a way. Um, and it's funny because when I was a kid, I would have given anything for an opportunity at 24 to cover, you know, a major pro beat. Yep. But I, I just think that you know, you're seeing now they'll hire younger, cheaper people who have to work twice as hard now because of the Internet. Right. And it, it does affect the quality of the work. There's no question about it. There's something to be, you know, there's something to be said about a guy who's been on a beat for 10 years or been around sports for 10 years who really understands, 10 or more years, I should say, who really understands the business and you can trust that, you know, he's been there, done that, he's seen it. Um, there's something about that kind of coverage that I think we're starting to lose a little bit. And it's not to say that young writers don't deserve opportunity, but I do think there is something to be said about the, the learning process, the paying the dues, the, the climbing the ladder, which a lot of us did. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't happen as much. And it's not to blame the writer, to blame the paper. You know, you, you have to develop writers. And I don't know if that, that happens. So there is a lot more sloppiness. There's a lot more got to get this out first. Who tweets it first now gets credit? I mean, really? Yeah. You know, shouldn't it be who has it right and who has the most information, the best cut? It used to be when you had a story, you could spend a whole day on it, get it to the cop 
copy this by 8 or 9 o'clock, have it read by a couple of editors, make sure you have all your ducks in a row, every single piece of information, and then the next morning, that's when the bombshell hits. Yeah. Now, it's get it into 140 characters so that you get credit for having it first, and then rush a story onto the web that might not, that might not have enough information on it, tip off all your competition, and now everybody's working on the same story. <laughs> and, and, you, know, and, you, know, you know what I mean, Tom? So I think, in a way, as much as you know, the Internet has helped the business, I, I do think it's also taken away from those a really well-reported story that, on breaking news anyway, it doesn't get done as well anymore. But, of course, there's still great journalism out there, and we see it every day. Now, you came from the paper background. How do you... Uh how are you liking working on TV now? I love it because there are no more deadlines. Hmm. <laughs> and deadlines used to, you know, with, is the one thing that, that can be frustrating at times, like I said, because you really want to get the most out of it. Um, yeah. And when you're watching a game and you have to write and watch at the same time, people don't understand what the beat writers will go through in any sport, whether it's, you know, baseball, baseball it, you know, you, you're missing out on important parts of a late part of a post-game. Football, everything, when it's played against the deadline, uh, you can't really sit and really watch and see what's happening because you've got to bang out quick, you know, a team. Like, think about game six of the NBA Finals. Okay. You're on deadline, and the Spurs are up five with a minute to go. If you're, if you're writing a lead about the Spurs winning a championship and the Heat losing... That's a big deal. Yeah. And then, in, and then in a minute's time, you have overtime and things have changed. You've got to rewrite half of that story because you have a story that's called Running Story that the paper needs the second the game ends. It's the, the first one. They want it without quotes. People don't understand it. You, you file the minute the game's over with. Hmm. So the story with quotes that looks a lot prettier, that's later on in the night. Yeah. The first edition, the first run is this just slap it together running kind of story, and it's mayhem. So, a long way to get to your answer. I'm sorry. No, it's great. Is, is that now I can watch a game all the way, really consider it, and then we go on the air right away. My thoughts, I feel, are a little bit more, a better collected, mm-hmm. and and it's a lot. And I have to admit, it's a lot more fun. Now, the fact that I have to wear makeup, I guess, makes up for the <laughs> fact that I don't have to <laughs> rewrite a story four or five times. Yeah. Or else, but it, it's been it's been a lot of fun. It, it's a learning experience, and uh, and, and it's, it really is. It, it's a it's a great it was a great step that I was nervous taking, mm-hmm. but now I feel like it was the best move I ever made. It's like a little mix. Sure. We got the draft coming up. Knicks have the 24th pick in the first round. What do you think they're going to do with this pick? Yeah, it's a guy called, and now write this down because okay. some people know his name. It's very important. The guy's name is Best Player Available. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what they're going to do. And I, and I, I, I say it tongue in 